My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to diving into God's Word, opening it up uh, with you guys. So we're in the second to last week in our series in Genesis. And so we've got one more week after this one. And that's covered. That what we're doing is we've been covering the life of uh, Abraham and Sarah. And uh, we've called this series Faith in the Fog. Um, because over and over again, God's calling upon Abraham to trust him for the promises that he's made. Right? Even when the visibility is low, even when Abraham can't see what's going on, he's calling him to trust. So at the beginning of the story, God has called Abraham into a brand new life. He's, he's, that life includes, Abraham, come to the land that I'm going to show you. Right. And so there's this new land that he's going to lead him to. Um, it also, God gives him a promise that Abraham would have many descendants. And thirdly, God promises to bless Abraham such that he would be blessed, but also that he would be a blessing to the whole world. Um, so those kind of three main ideas tend to be the themes that we carry throughout uh, this text, this, yeah, this idea of land, descendants, and blessing. But at every turn, Abraham, he faces difficulty. He faces tests and trials. So um, sometimes uh, he steps out in faith in response to those trials, but other times he falters and he fails and he falls on his face. And, uh, and that's kind of what the story of Abraham has been like. Um, but throughout it all, um, God's developing Abraham uh, such that he can have the vision of faith that can cut through that fog, right? Um, so even when he can't see where he's going or how God's going to lead him there, God's plan for Abraham would be that he would respond to God's call and the promises that he's given to him with a real trust. And so in this way, Abraham, he serves as a model for us all, right? Um, because we can relate to that. Um, we can relate to the trial of having to trust God throughout a difficulty. Um, but even when he's in his worst moments, he serves as an encouragement to us, right? Um, because the, throughout this story, again and again, the story's proving that even when humans falter, even when humans fail, God is still faithful. Even when Abraham falls down, God is going to continue to work his plan. And so that's the big picture. So we're diving back in. We're in Genesis 21. We start in verse 22. And it begins like this. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the army, said to Abraham, and I'm just stop right there because we have new characters that are showing up. Who are these people? Um, <clears throat> we need to introduce them. So we've talked about Abraham a little bit, but who is Abimelech and who is Phicol? Well, um, he might be familiar to, to you because uh, we've talked about Abimelech before. His name uh, is really just a title. It means my father is king. Av means father. Avi means my father. And Melech means king. So Avi Melech, my father is king. And Abimelech, uh, yeah, we talked about him before. He appeared two weeks ago by the sermon reckoning and just a chapter ago um, in the text. And so in this um, section that we, we talked about a couple weeks ago, Abraham, he makes this faithless decision uh, to really save his own skin. And the way that he does that is by, um, he disguises who his wife is, right? He fears she's too beautiful. Um, I've been like, he's going to kill me because my wife is so beautiful. And so the long story short is he says, no, this is just my sister. And what happens is God appears to Abimelech, confronts him, Abimelech is like, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm innocent in all this. And so Abimelech, he gives Sarah back to Abraham, um, and he confronts Abraham about this whole deception. And Abimelech, he also even makes amends uh, to Abraham, including like a large quantity of gifts. Um, it says even a thousand pieces of silver, and it sounds like a lot of silver to me. Um, but he invites Abraham into his land, and he says, behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. And so Abraham, he takes him up on that promise. Um, other things that come out of that is God, he heals Abimelech's household, whom he'd afflicted on account of Sarah. And for Abraham, well, he gets his wife back, he receives all those gifts, and he takes Abimelech up on that invitation to enter the land. Um, so there's plenty of blessing that comes out of this, but again, this is a failure moment for Abraham. He, tends, he looks like, out of this, that he's been a pretty deceptive guy. Um, he's acting like a deceiver rather than a truth teller. 
And so that's all in the background of this story. Uh, all that is the history there. Um, now, in the intervening time, Abraham has also had the promise God made to him finally, finally, finally fulfilled. Um, God has given Sarah a child. Um, she's given birth to Isaac. So despite all these failings, God has come through. And that's one of the big points of this series, that even when humans fail and falter, God is faithful on his promise. And that's true for you. Even when we fail and falter, our salvation is not dependent on our own works, on our own actions, um, but it's on Christ's work and what he's done on the cross for you. Um, and so God leads us in that knowledge that it's not by our own deeds, our own actions. It is God and his faithfulness that secures our salvation. So that sets up kind of the beginning of the chapter. Abraham, uh, finally, with heir God has promised through Sarah, um, but we have Abimelech showing up again. And this time, he's not alone. <laughs> he's brought Phicol. <laughs> Phicol. Um, who is Phicol? Uh, apparently the commander of his armies. Now, if I am Ab Abraham, and I know all this has happened, right? I know <laughs> how I've wronged this guy in the past, how in order for that guy to get out of the situation I put him in, he ended up giving me a lot of stuff. Um, and then he shows up with his commander of his armies. I might actually be a little bit concerned. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, but I would be a little bit worried. Um, he's brought his, his uh, commander with him. Um, how do I know that he's, you know, not just giving me that silver and whatnot just so he can take it back again, right? Um, it could go poorly, but, um, and it, it, it seems at this point that those promises God made, they might be under threat, right? Those promises that we just talked about, land, seed, a blessing, uh, of descendants and blessing, um, those all could be totally under threat at this moment. But this is what happens. It says in verse 22, At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, which he, he's done before, or with my descendants or with my posterity, but as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And so this interaction, it's remarkably a good one. And I think that's pretty noteworthy in itself, like because we can slide right past that. But if I'm honest, I mean, this could have gone in a different direction, right? Um, and so from Abraham's standpoint, like, praise God. Like, this is amazing. Um, he has favor, has the favor of Abimelech. And so I just love that phrase, God is with you in all that you do. I think at this point it's important for Christians to understand that we can relate to Abraham in that way. Um, God is with us. Um, and I, I want to talk about just, yeah, the reality of that statement and then, and then the, the witness of it, the visibility of that statement. Um, so first, like the reality of that statement for Christians, um, let me just pull up a couple of verses um, to remind us of this truth that God is with us. Because um, the gospel says that while we are still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, while we are still sinners. Um, and he died in order that he might pay for the sins of all who believe in him. So if you accept him, um, he's paid for your sins. Um, so those who accept him, his message, his sacrifice on their behalf, he has forgiven us. Um, and so if you believe in Christ by faith, I want to remind you of this, that God is with you. <clears throat> he's with you. Um, I love what Jesus says in what we call the Great Commission. It's in Matthew 28, and it says this, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. I'm with you always the very end of the age. It's not always easy to feel that, right? Uh, that can be difficult to experience. Um, for some of us, we can question, right, like God's care and love. Um, we think, okay, well, that might be true for some people, but for me, I just don't really feel it, right? Um, for whatever reason, right, we might think that's true for them. I don't know if it's true for me. Um, but I want to remind you that that's not how God's economy works. When Jesus says, I'm with you, the very end of the age, 
There's no conditions. He means that. Um, some of us might be maybe going through a situation, right, where it just feels like God's not winning, like, like evil is prevailing in our lives, like what is going on? Um, maybe we're traveling just through that land of darkness. And um, even for us who walk through the valley, right, of the shadow of death, the, we are to fear no evil, right? That's Psalm 23. For he is with you. He will comfort you and continue to shepherd you through that. Um, another verse I'd like to share is this one. It's John 16, verse 7. And I share this one because it reminds us of the Spirit's role in our life as our help and as our advocate. And Jesus says this. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And I share this one. Because it's saying something that maybe should sound ridiculous to the ears. It might sound ridiculous to the disciples, right? Um, He's saying, you know, unless I go away, it'll be to your advantage. I said that wrong, but it's to your advantage that I go away. Um, So at the time, the disciples have Jesus in the flesh with them, right? Um, He's right there with them, and he's telling, look, it's better if I leave. Um, Because then I'll send the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, he says later, will guide you into all truth. And that's our prayer, right? That God would guide us into all truth. Um, So I just pray that we'd be encouraged by that. The reality that the Spirit is with us. That God is with us. And that he is with us in, in what we do. Now, the second thing is kind of the visibility of that statement, right? Um, if it's true, in a, in a real sense, do we also feel it, or can we see it to be true? Does the world see it to be true? Um, because this thing that Abimelech says about Abraham is something we'd love to have people say about Christians, right? Wow, God is with you in all that you do. <laughs> um, that's what we would hope everyone would say of, of Christians, that they'd see God working in them. And I love the way Peter pictures it. And this is in 1 Peter 2. And he's talking to um, he's talking to believers. And he says this, You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak of you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so this I mean, to me, this is always like, wow, this is a huge calling that he has given to us. Um, A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That type of language is just amazing, right? He's called us to be a royal priesthood. In other words, those who are connecting um, the world to God. We are all a part of that. And so, um, and then then later he's like... um, Keep your conduct among the world honorable, among the Gentiles honorable, so that even when they speak against you as evildoers, they might see your deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So, like Abraham, sometimes we feel like strangers in a strange land, right? Um, We live as exiles until Christ comes. And the hope is that even if the world is speaking against Christians as evildoers, which was true in the early church. It's true in part today. Um, the hope and prayer is that on a personal level, um, that those who might be quick to denounce Christianity would actually hesitate. <laughs> and they'd say, well, you know what, though? He is a good guy that I know. Or, or, or she is a great friend to me. Um, she's compassionate. You know, or like, he's weird, sure, but I do, I do like him, <laughs> right? Um, that's... That's kind of the hope. That's the hope. That even when the world speaks a message of condemnation over, what, Christian theology or something, the real interactions with Christians would be positive. Now, can we say, 
that that is always true. No, it's not always true. Um, there's plenty that Christians have had to apologize for, or things the church has had to apologize for, to make right. Um, but that instinct to repent and to correct and to repair is also a part of the testimony that we bear, right? Um, that instinct to be to doing that is should be should play into that testimony that we have, and so that's the vision for us um, who claim Christ. For us sitting here today, um, those who believe in Jesus, that's the vision that He has for us. Um, that people, after knowing us, they would think, "Wow, God must be with them. God must be with them." And that is a high calling, right? Does that feel like a high calling? It feels like a high calling. Um, To be a priesthood to the nations? My goodness. It is a high calling. But through Jesus, and despite ourselves, but through Jesus, that is the identity that we've been given. And, um, And this is all, you know, a bit of an aside from the story of Abraham. But what would this look like for us in our lives? What would it... Um, mean for you and for me to think of ourselves as those who are going out into the world as as missionaries, as those who have, um, whom God has called a royal priesthood, right? That we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his light. Um, What would that look like? What would it look like to think of our neighbor as the one whom we're a priest for? And maybe that's a a really big word that we can't like um, engage with, but um, maybe something less intimidating, just the one whom God has put in their way to be able to connect to him, right? Um, it, and it's just so easy to forget that, um, to, to not have God's vision for the people around us, but um, the only thing I've found um, that we can do is to pray, or the best thing I've found, I should say, that we can do is to pray. Pray for them, and that will stir up our hearts uh, and, our, and our vision to align with God's vision for our role in this world. So let's continue with this story. Um, Abraham, he should have a clear reminder. Okay, God is with him. Even Abimelech says it. Um, and a piece of the evidence is just that, that um, there's just this obvious moment of providence in his life. God, he is favor with Abimelech. God is fulfilling his promises. So verse 25 When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard it until today. So we've got our agreement in place, right? Um, But Abraham, he's seemingly testing it. (laughs) He's saying he's brought up this issue that actually we are having. Um, And what there is is there is a dispute about a well. Uh, It's about access to water. And so remember, Abraham, he is a a shepherd. That is his business. Um, And so if you wonder, why is he always traveling around so much? It's for that reason, right? He's a shepherd. Um, So sometimes he's moving just the herds along region to region. Sometimes he's staying in one region for a time. Um, But that is is his, his life. And he has a problem now, though, that he's in Abimelech's region, and it's water access. Um, water would be essential, not only for him and the humans with him, but also for um, the livestock too, right? <laughs> um, the sheep and the goats and all that, they need water. Um, and I'm no expert, but I, I think that's true. <laughs> um, so when you're in a place like where he is now, there can be disputes about access to water, Right? Um, Different shepherding groups, like those interactions could become heated when um, resources are scarce. And where he is now, resources are scarce, right? In this case, they're in uh, the desert. Water is not going to be super abundant. It is scarce. It is there. You have to dig a well for it, though. (laughs) Um, And Abraham, he's done that, but his well has been seized by those who are... Uh, under Abimelech's, he calls them servants of Abimelech. Um, So he's really putting this agreement that he has with Abimelech to the test now. Um, And so Abimelech, whether he knows about this or not, he's insistent. He says, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. And so we can take him at his word, or methinks doth protest too much, like (laughs) maybe you know something. Um, But who knows? But verse 27, let's continue on. So Abraham took sheep 
and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. A covenant is just an agreement. Um, so when these types of uh, bilateral covenants were made uh, in the Old Testament, they would often involve a sacrifice, which is what we're going to see next. And so it says, Abraham, he set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? And he said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me um, that I dug this well. And so therefore, the place was called Beersheba, because uh, there both of them swore an oath. And Beersheba, it literally means a well of the oath. Um, or you could also translate it, the well of seven, which would be in reference to those seven lambs that were there. So there's a little bit of a play on words here. Um, verse 32, so they made a covenant at Beersheba. Uh, then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, they rose up and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. And so what we see here is God is, is proven faithful. He's continuing to protect Abraham, even by providing water. And so to me, this story, the previous story to this, uh, kind of echoes it in a, in a way. Um, the previous story was that Abraham, he'd sent uh, Hagar and Ishmael, her son, out into the desert. And what becomes their problem? It's water, right? Um, they fear they're dying of thirst. And so what does God do? He sees them, hears them. He opens Hagar's eyes, and she sees a well that's appeared as if by miracle. It's provision. And this is similar, right? Now God is working in the heart of Abimelech to have favor on Abraham for the same issue, a well. Um, now it may not seem as miraculous as that story of Hagar and Ishmael, um, but we must understand and remember that every good and perfect gift is from God, right? And whether it seems like uh, a miracle or whether it seems like normal, it's all from God, right? Um, it's all from God's hand. Um, it's always a God thing. And so God has provided Abraham this water. And Abraham, he has this uh, curious response. And when I read through this, uh, in preparation for preaching the message, I had so many questions. <laughs> like, um, because w one of the verses that had the most questions was verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And so the first question is, well, what's a tamarisk tree? Because <laughs> I don't know. Um, and the second was, well, why? Like, why is that included? Um, like, is there some sort of cultural meaning associated with the tamarisk tree? Um, did it, you know, mean something to, to that people? Um, maybe there's something literary going on here, right? Like, maybe it's a symbol picked up later in Scripture. And so I started to look for that and looked for tamarisk in other parts of the Bible. And you can find it, but it didn't seem very compelling to me. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just keep wondering, is it like calling back to Abraham's, like, if you remember when he first came into the, the promised land, he, um, he began to worship at these different sites, and some of them included trees, and like maybe it's sort of like repeating that theme, um, like encapsulating this beginning and end to, to Abraham's time um, with worship and sacrifice and calling upon God. Um, or maybe it was just calling all the way back to Eden, right? <laughs> like there's a, a tree uh, in Eden, this is tree of life, and there's some sort of like fulfillment happening here. And so wondering all these things, and um, for the record, the reason why we might wonder about all those things is that we believe every word in the Bible is, is inspired by God. It's purposeful. Um, it may not always feel that way, but we believe that God inspired the scriptures, and so that all of it is intentional. Um, so what's going on? Well, first, what even is the tamarisk? Like, what are we talking about? Um, so this tree, probably uh, the tree being referenced here, it's also called a tamarisk ethel or an ethel tree. Um, it's native to the region. It's like an evergreen tree. It's super adapted for life in water-scarce regions. It's pretty tough. Um, and it has these long uh, green leaves. Um, so don't think of like a pine tree that, that shoots straight up. Think of uh, a 
something more that looks more shrubby than that, <laughs> right? Um, so it ends up having like a really dense appearance. Um, and so the main uses of this tree were for windbreaks and for shade. Um, and just kind of speaking of the kind of the density that it would create. And so in a desert region like we're discussing here, I think the primary purpose would be for, for shade, right? Um, to shade uh, the well, the area around it. And um, there are a number of cool things about the tamarisk, but one of them is just that they spread too. Um, so rather than simply growing by seed, they can also grow like vegetatively, like by shoots. Um, and so in other words, when, when Abraham plants this, he can probably just take um, like a shoot of another tree and, and plant that there and it'll grow root. Now, eventually, because of this process, the tamarisk can grow into like sort of like a grove. Like it can, it can really expand. Um, and it can grow as high as, I think I have it down for 60 feet, which would be pretty high. Um, that would be certainly a big one. Um, but uh, so hopefully now you can sort of visualize at least what's going on. <laughs> he's, he's planted this uh, small tree, maybe even just a shoot. Um, and his flocks are being watered, right? Everyone's being cared for. And he begins to worship God and praise God. And it specifically says that he calls on the name of, of Yahweh, El Olam, or you can translate that, the everlasting God or the eternal God. And so this text, what it's doing is highlighting uh, the, the foreverness of God, right? And then also this small tamarisk shoot, right? These two things together. And so what does this say? Well, no one really plants a tree if they aren't planning to stick around for a while, right? Like, you wouldn't do that. It's, it's a long-term decision. I once purchased uh, some seeds for, uh, if you've heard of the giant sequoia, right? Um, one of the most massive trees on earth. Um, they can grow 200, 250 feet in the air. Their diameter of their trunk is like 20 feet across. I mean, they're amazing. And I once bought some seeds, and I planted it in my apartment <laughs> in Michigan. And I had five, and, and one of them grew up to about an inch, and then it died. <laughs> um, but even if it had lived, like even if the best case scenario and it had lived, like I would never have seen it in its glory, right? Like it takes like a thousand years for this thing to grow up to the size of, of the, the amazing ones that you could find in California. Um, now, funny, there's actually one in Michigan, or maybe several, but in Empire, Michigan, you may not know this, but there are actually giant sequoias growing there um, because it's a good climate for it. But even still, we're not going to see it like it's awesome because it's only been there 80 years, so it just looks like a normal tree. <laughs> but anyways, the tamarisk, it's not quite like that, right? But still, the act of planting a tree is an act of faith, right? It's saying that God is with us, and the everlasting God will be with us. And Abraham, he's not planting this necessarily for himself. Um, maybe if he lives long enough, it could be for himself. But more so, he's probably planting it for Isaac, right? He's planting it for Isaac's descendants. He's planting it for the future. He's taking steps today that reflect his faith in the God who said, I will make you into a great nation. Right? If you didn't believe that, otherwise this does not make sense. This little shoot makes no sense. Um, and so he knows God to be the everlasting God, the eternal God. And so to plant this tamarisk, it's a, a step of faith. And Abraham does this because he knows God is with him, just like we said earlier, or what Abimelech said earlier. And so that's my main point today, is that when you know God is with you, like Abimelech said, you can step out in faith and plant a tamarisk, even in the desert. When you know God is with you, you can step out in faith and plant a tamarisk, even in the desert. You can take a small step of faith today that may look small, may look strange, but in reality is hopeful and is expectant upon God to yield a harvest. And so I just started thinking through these, and you know, what would be some examples of, of these steps of faith? What would it be an example of, of, of planting a tamarisk today? Um, and one thing that came to mind was spiritual disciplines, right? Spiritual disciplines, um, prayer, Bible reading, community, um, meditation on God's word, um, fasting, all these like things that we know about, um, but maybe don't yield 
<laughs> like results right away, always, right? Um, sometimes spiritual disciplines can feel like, I read the Bible, I'm not really sure what I got out of that, but I'm just going to keep trucking along, I guess. Um, and so if our intention is we're going to get immediate results out of this, sometimes we'll be left disappointed, <laughs> right? Um, Eugene Peterson, he, he wrote a book, uh, it's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Um, and it's a commentary on a subset of psalms in, in the book of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. Um, but part of the theme of that book is that, yeah, people are just preconditioned in our society, in our world, to look for quick fixes, right? Um, and they struggle with the idea that discipleship is like a long-term adventure. And so he writes this. He says, one aspect of the world that I've been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. We assume that if something can be done at all, it can be done quickly and efficiently. Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. He says, it's not difficult in such a world to get a person interested in the message of the gospel, but it's uh, terrifically difficult to sustain the interest. Right? Um, so he says, look, um, to come to co know Jesus, it's uh, to, to walk in this life of faith that God is calling us to. It's not like a 10-minute oil change, right? Um, it's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong pilgrimage. Uh, it's a process of discipleship that we never really graduate from, but we're always um, journeying. And that's important for us to understand when we think about, you know, coming to worship, coming to service, um, and praising God together, or reading the Bible, or, or sharing Christ, because sometimes these things take a while, right? Um, discipleship is a long-term journey. He, he writes this later in the book, um, talking about, um, he's talking about coming to worship, coming to um, church, and stuff like that, and he says, I put great emphasis on the fact that Christians worship because they want to, right? Not because they're forced to, but I have never said that we worship because we feel like it. Feelings are great liars. If Christians worshipped only when they felt like it, there would be precious little worship. We live in what one writer has called the age of sensation. We think that if we don't feel something, there could be uh, no authenticity in doing it. But the wisdom of God says something different, that we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God. Um, and that's true. That's true for coming to church. That's true for every spiritual discipline. Um, reading scripture, meditating on God's word, fasting, community, all these things. Um, they can just feel like tiny steps, right? Um, maybe feeling fruitless at times, but if they're all in the same direction, um, then it may just turn out that they are transformative, right? They're like seeds planted in the soil, small steps of gardening, as it were. Um, it's like planting a tiny tamarisk in the desert. Um, it feels like nothing, and maybe it would be if God were not to be relied on. And so what are the small steps of faith that, that you can take? Only because you know God is good and God is real. Um, I love this in Isaiah. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, Make it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Um, I just love that, you know, banking on uh, what God has promised, right? Um, so what, what might be some other examples beyond spiritual disciplines? I, I thought of, okay, Maybe not just discipling ourselves, but what about when you take the venture to disciple someone else, right? Um, spiritual disciplines in their life is, is, you know, maybe even more tenuous, right? Um, we don't know whether it will yield a fruit, but we trust God anyways, right? We invest ourselves in relationships. What about parenting? We just did child dedications, right? Parenting is, is like planting a tamarisk, right? Um, we a hope and we pray and we rely on each other um, that God would, would do the work, right? And that's what we're leaning on. Um, 
other things that would require uh, faith is church planting, right? Um, the act of, of believing, is this going to bear fruit, right? Is this process going to, to yield results? It can be a lot of work in the meantime. Um, what are other things? Maybe giving could be that for you. Like, it doesn't feel like it's producing um, fruit, um, but can we trust it to God in order that he might um, produce what he's going to produce? Um, man, there may be so many things, so many things of what planting a tamarisk in your own life could be. Um, maybe it's a step of faith that only you know, right? It's what God's leading to you to do now because of greater vision that he's given you for the future. Um, something that requires you to trust God. Now, will God always be faithful to how we expect him to be faithful? Um, the answer is no, right? Because we expect things of God that aren't in his will. Um, and in fact, if you keep reading in Genesis, <laughs> you'll find that these characters come back, and Isaac comes back to the wells, and guess what he finds? They're filled in. <laughs> They're filled in. They've been sabotaged. Um, but is that the end of the story? No, once again, it's not the end of the story. And God continues to work despite the setbacks, despite the ups and downs, despite the moments that we want to throw in the towel. Um, the ultimate story of redemption is already written, right? God wins. And faith is saying, okay, I see my part in it. And whether I see this tree go up or whether I don't live to see that, <laughs> that part of the time, I'm still going to tend to it in faith, right? I will wait on long-suffered beauty. Sin, it causes us to worry. It causes us to seek microwave results. But God's grace to us is to give us patience in his plan, compelling us not to lose heart, to keep praying and pray and, and never give up, to keep trusting and to keep taking those small steps towards him. And we do that because we remember that God is with you. God is with us. When you know that God is with you, you can step out in faith. You can plant even a tree, even in the desert. And so let's rejoice in that knowledge and let's worship the everlasting God. Uh, God, you are good. Uh, we thank you uh, for your kindness, for your provision, um, for how you work in our lives when we don't expect it, for how you work in our lives when we don't see it <laughs> and we need to trust it. Uh, we thank you um, for... Uh, so much, Jesus, for how you've rescued us from sin, how you've forgiven us of, uh, yeah, just the sins and the mistakes that we make, uh, that you've done that for us on the cross. Uh, Jesus, we just want to live for you, and sometimes uh, living for you takes these steps of faith, um, but help us to remember that you are with us um, to the very end, and that, uh, yeah, we, we just trust you. Uh, to be at work in our lives. Uh, we pray this all in your name. Amen.